Good morning, good morning, good morning. Another lovely day in paradise. I hope you are well. I just thought I'd uh, record a quick note on the way to work. Now all the, the GDC malarkey is behind me. It's not behind everyone. The, uh, the other dentist I keep hearing about who also failed, forgot to pay his ARI is uh, still not back on the register it's, and we're already into February and that's because um, he couldn't produce the CPD and then and then sort of I've gone into a sort of a blazing row with the GDC and thought that he could bully them into uh, agreeing him put him back on the register on the grounds that that would be the most sensible thing to do and then sort the CPD out later but uh, they are the GDC take a sort of pragmatic view that why bother striking you off when you're already off and they can just refuse to put you back on. So, um, well, as you can see their point of view, save taxpayer money. But uh, anyway, he doesn't see it that way and uh, he's got, he's, I think, you know, his approach, I'm not saying which approach is right or wrong, all I'm saying is I'm back on the register and he isn't. Uh, his approach was to sort of get a bit all emotional about it and start arguing whereas my approach was simply to ask them what colour ink they wanted the application completed in and uh, and also you know I mean I was able to draw on a lot more CPD perhaps than, than most dentists having just had the CQC inspection that really saved my bacon <coughs> so so Anyway, uh, last I heard was that because he's got a non-EEA uh, qualification, uh, he's they're, they're making him sit an IELTS language test to prove that he can speak sufficient English to join the UK Dental Register. <laughs> I mean, this is a bloke who's had to cancel a month's worth of patients, has already got a surgery, has already been working in this country as a dentist, you know, has obviously got the English, um, but uh, rules is rules, regulations is regulations, and we're a statutory body, and it's the law, you know. The old is the law, so and it's the law. If you don't have the right degree, you have to have an English test, and they don't do those every day, and they certainly don't do them on the internet. So um, you know, he's still he's probably several stages past furious, I'd imagine, at the moment. The thing I think which doesn't makes it not funny is this, the, any, I mean, dental surgeries, especially the smaller ones now are on a knife edge. I mean, they are on a knife edge of profitability. And I say that not because they're any worse than the big guys, the big guys are literally insolvent. So I'd rather be a small guy that's marginally profitable than, than a venture capitalist who's bought a dental group that you know, where, where which relies on the greater fool theory whereby you need to find another venture capitalist who will buy your group off you for more a lot more than you paid for it on the basis that he himself thinks that he will be able to find a greater fool to get it off take it off of his hands. And the whole thing is a massive great game of past the hand grenade. Um, which like the Southern Cross residential homes always blows up you know it always blows up they always get to the point where they realize that they can't massage the old debit dar figures any look any further and <clears throat> no one's gonna buy it and they have a usually I mean if you look at is it Krillian Krillian you know these things they it's known well in advance that they're gonna go the people the masters of the universe know that these things are gonna collapse and so when you get a company which is which is obviously doomed, then what happens is they leverage the hell out of it. You know, it's the old Gordon Gecko. Not quite Gordon Gecko, because what Gordon Gecko used to do was buy companies with loans based on the firm's assets that they hadn't taken out themselves because they didn't deem it sensible. So he took out unsensible loans and in many cases to buy the companies themselves and um, and then used to break the companies up because and throw away the bits that 
or no use, the, the loss making bits, and and sell the profit the profit making bits. And that's uh, you know that's sort of what he would call creative destruction. That's sort of market forces at work. Obviously, the people who were working in those parts of the company that were loss making but being subsidised all the time, it was a whole entity. Uh, didn't appreciate that approach. You know, they lost their jobs. The shareholders of the uh, company were reasonably happy because they sold. In generally, they sold the. Uh, out, you know, they sold their shares at a higher price. The people who were the heart and soul of the company, the founders and the shareholders who wouldn't sell, uh, took a loss. And that was the basis of the enmity, wasn't it, in the Gordon Gecko film. It was between Gordon Gecko, the, the breaker up of companies, the, the, the creative destruction, uh, and the founder, you know, who didn't want to accept that the thing was going bust. Well, uh, venture capital, uh, it's not really like that. There are no profitable parts to a dental group. <laughs> you know? There might be profit centres, and I should imagine the private dentistry is a profit centre. The NHS dentistry is a loss centre, if you're going to be honest. It has been since 1992. Uh, there's a lot of cross-subsidy going on. There's a practice locally in Canterbury about 15 miles away from me that's just decided that it's not going to renew its NHS contract. 25,000 patients all of a sudden without an NHS dentist. Um, Bradley and McGregor, very old, you know, established, goes back 100 years, like, you know, got a massive great Georgian townhouse, extremely well situated right in the middle of Canterbury, you know, lot, a lot of money there. The guy um, bought the surgery, I think, for quite a few million. Then immediately uh, got uh, got hauled up by the NHS for irregularities in his contract. And now, surprise, surprise, says that he doesn't want their lousy, stinking contract anyway. Um, and went to the press and made a big deal about it and saying that the NHS doesn't pay enough to do a decent job and he's been cross subsidising the NHS out of the private part of the practice for a long time now and he just can't carry on doing it and the quality of the work is less than he would like etc etc so I mean uh, probably that practice will survive you know if he avoids jail in a sort of much dumbed down sort of reduced shrunken way and I've seen these practices before. I went to see, went to inspect a practice that used to be a pogo practice, a big anaesthetic practice that had had like eight dentists working doing anaesthetics all day every day, and uh, it had been sold to one guy, non UK qualified guy, who was rattling around in this massive great practice, and he was the only dentist there. And I was there because he was, you know, they were investigating him because. Um, Again, a contract irregularities, which is a sort of code word for gone too far in bending the rules, you know, on the NHS uh, because of uh, financial reasons. And it's usually the, you know, that's the beginning of the end. So anyway, but we'll see, you know. So this Armageddon in the NHS, I mean, is it? it's affecting me locally and I know it's affected other dentists because other dentists have told me stories like this you know oh you know we've got a big practice in our area that's got this problem it's got that problem the when the budgets were put over to local authorities I think it was anticipated that you know we asked if the dental budgets could be ring fenced and uh, the Bridgman house said no no we're not, why should we have one, why should we ring fence dentistry when we don't ring fence paediatric cardiac care or we don't ring fence urgent cancer testing. Nothing's ring fenced, it all goes in the pot. And we knew damn well that if it all went in the pot with urgent cardiac care and stuff like that, then dentistry, it would effectively be the end of the NHS dental service. It, it would, you know, it would 
have such a low priority that, and, and, and well, to put it another way, sort of greedy eyes on committees on which dentists are never represented. I mean, there's never, you know, they put a they put a couple of doctors on, they, they'll put a layperson on, they'll put an optician on, but they won't put a dentist on. The dentist will know the doctors will look out for you. You know, what are this sort of quasi dentists are all failed doctors. You know, don't you worry you failed doctor you're the proper doctors will that will make sure that you're all right and of course they you know it's just, it's just ridiculous because no committee that doesn't have a dentist will ever represent dentistry properly and even when I've been up to Manchester to see the nice committees who are supposed to you know when they've been working on explicitly dental dental remits there's dentistry and nothing else and they've got, they have got a dentist on, you know, they have supposed to, supposedly they do have a, a supposed general practitioner on. Although the one I saw was really didn't know much, didn't know much about general practice and certainly didn't stick up for general practitioners. Uh, and they have like an academic dentist there who's, uh, uh, who's, you know, who's never run a practice and so really can't know, you know, who's going to set rules regarding the provision of dentistry not knowing whether they'll ever be put into practice, whether they're feasible or not. Um, but so, so even the committees that have dentists on them don't represent dentists. So how the committees that don't have dentists on them are supposed to safeguard den the dental budget, I don't know. And I don't think that was the point. I think the point was that uh, in in sort of giving the budgets to the local authorities to, to sort of lump in with the rest of their expenditure. I, kn I know, I'm pretty sure that Richmond House knew what that, that effect would be and that effect is that that dentistry money is no longer going to be spent on dentistry. They were saying, look, we think we can save more money out of the dental budget, but not centrally we can't because we can't spend money. All the time money is spent centrally on dentistry. We can't send it, spend it on paediatric cardiac care. You know, it's, it's too obvious when it's done centrally so well, let's mix it up let's mix it up in a bigger a budget for more things and then you know it'll be easier just to cut into it and so you've got this you know, is this collapse in the national health service is this coming i mean is it coming is this is what i'm seeing the sign of it is it finally going you know it's like the stock market it goes up and up and up and everybody you know, nobody wants to leave the party. It's like Warren Buffett said, you're at a party, you're at a party and you know that at midnight everything's going to turn into a pumpkin, but there are no hands on the clock. So how close are we? Nobody knows, you know? I mean, this could be it, or it could go on till way past I retire. That old saying that the, market, the stock market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So don't, don't short the stock market thinking you know that it's going to collapse because it's it will it will not collapse until well after you've gone bust and then it will collapse and you're like oh yeah I knew it was going to do that and it's a bit and a bit like that with the dental market you know we're saying no the NHS can't continue you know you can't continue with uh, expenses and uh, staff wages and uh, new legislation like pensions legislation and things like that you know it can't the whole thing, the market will have its way in the end. The free market will decide. It always does. You know, there's no amount of whether it's quantitative easing or Barry Cockroft deciding that he's he's Einstein when he quite patently wasn't. Um, the market will find out who's right and who's wrong. Um, for me, the, the collapse of a massive, massive NHS practice is is. Now, I'm, I'm finding it hard, I'm finding it, obviously it's unfortunate for the patients, but from a business point of view, I'm finding it hard to think of it as a bad thing, you know? Because having left the NHS sort of three times probably, and starting in 1990 and 1992 rather, and then, and then a couple of times, you know, later on, on the grounds that like there, there is a line in the sand you know that I will not cross you know I will not do things a certain way and that way was the way the only way to stay on the National Health Service and so me and the National Health Service party company the thousands of dentists didn't part company with it 
thousands of dentists still working on the NHS and, and many of those dentists, if you talk to them, will, will still tell you that it's a fantastic way to earn a living and they're very happy and um, they can't understand why anyone criticises it. You know, and yet, you, you know, and yet, I had a patient in yesterday who's come to me from an NHS practice who's missing three front teeth, um, has been made a partial denture, acrylic, which he doesn't like and doesn't wear because it covers up the roof of his mouth, which I don't think he was expecting, and wants to know if we can do him a smaller denture. And I looked in his mouth and he's got a upper left eight decayed right down to gum level. He's got half a dozen fillings, you know, decayed the fillings in his front teeth, new decay. He's had no toothbrushing instruction, he's had no instruction on diet. He's got a the mesio uh, lingual cusp has broken off his lower left six and he's rubbing his tongue. Uh, and, in, and that had been like that for so long that it was literally he literally could, didn't even know. When I said you've got a broken tooth, uh, it took him a minute to feel around and say, um, uh, Oh, yeah, 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 no, I do remember that breaking, yeah. And this is a guy who's just finished a course of NHS treatment <laughs> consisting of one denture. What will make the most money? The make, the make, what will make the most profit? Let's put it that way. What will make the most profit would be to make the denture and then ignore the rest of it. Don't do, don't extract the tooth that needs to be, don't do the fillings that need to be done. And certainly don't do the prevention, you know, the, the uh, oral hygiene instruction or the dietary advice. Or take any x-rays probably. Or even care about whether he likes the denture and can wear it. <laughs> you know, is it, are we on the verge of collapse? Are we? I mean, let me know. I'd love to know. I hope I'm around to see it because I've been predicting it for so, so long. But, you know, you never know, do you? Never know. Because, they, you know, well, you never know because it's always, someone, someone's always willing to work for a bit less, aren't they? Someone's also always willing to bend the rules a bit more, you know, and hope that they don't get caught. Or uh, use uh, crapper materials. <laughs> source, uh, source the equipment from non-C marked. Oh, no, I do that now. Okay. Cut, cut. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye.